area is specifically annotated. So what they did, the photograph had the same level of detail. Show the name of the photograph, the number, the location, the altitude, the time it was taken, and so on and so forth. They transfer that to the key map. So that quick analysis can be made as to, all right, where do we need to make coverage to improve our ability to understand what the battle's doing? Beyond that, you start developing on a daily basis the plan director, which is basically a key cartographical map that the French and the Americans produced, which allows you to annotate all the key target sets and apply other additional information from the intelligence perspective. The exploitation piece is how the analysis comes together. How do you apply all this data so you get the big picture as to what the enemy is doing? So here you have the front lines. The basics for military intelligence back in the First World War was order of battle analysis. In other words, what division was facing us at this particular sector? Which is good because you have an understanding of basically what that division's capabilities were. But it was also erroneous because you don't have the ability to factor in new capabilities. So you're basically at the mercy of an old frame of reference. But you can see here lots of German units packed in. And the German division was only about 10,000 men, whereas American was 26,000. So you had a lot more units to work with. So you exploit the data. So everybody's an expert. In my years in military intelligence, you always had an aviator became the commander of the intelligence, because he was the aviator. But the rest of us worked with that individual because, we, like all of us, we're all experts when it comes to doing intel. And here's the American way of doing business. Keep your hands off the prints. So let's make sure that folks who fl filter into the office don't say, hey, what is this? Hey, we got serious business here. You look at the information, in this case with a magnifying glass, to kind of give you an idea of what you're looking at. But more interesting enough, if you have the overlapping coverage, you get a second dimension in place. And in this case here at Ypre, if you were to look at a stereoscope of those two shots, you'd see the buildings rise up. When you have that ability, it really enhances your ability to do analysis. And stereo, as we'll see shortly, is critical. So what are you looking at? Here's trench lines. You have a Greek, like the classical Greek. You have a broken line. You have an indented line. You have a sinewy line. So if you want to look at a photograph of a trench, here's the Hindenburg line, where you have three meter separation between both sides of that trench. And you can see a distinct pattern of indented and Greek. Anybody want to venture a guess why there was three meters in this particular part of the Hindenburg line? because the British had brought the tank into the battle. And you needed a wide trench, so if that tank were to roll into it, it'd be stuck in it. So target sets become identified. And then there's identification features that are added into the conflict. So look at this. A red cross, prominently displayed, is obviously a hospital. So they're basically telling folks, if you find a Red Cross at this target location, please assume that there are casualties there. Now, once in a while, somebody took advantage of that. But for the most part, I think the combatants basically adhered to the fact that there was casualties being treated. Now, in shooting the front, I go into discussion about camouflage and deception, because this is one of the fascinating things about how the war evolves. What you find is basically towards 1917, 1918, the entire front sector is being camouflaged using netting, as you're seeing here, for in this case, valuable, valuable uh, rail lines going into this sector. The hangarettes for this particular Cadrone G4 unit are camouflaged. You see camouflage on the aeroplanes themselves. But what is happening is a revolution in the mind, because what you're trying to do is disrupt what is perceived to be reality. And what you have here is Andre Marais, who is a camoufleur for the French army. In his book, this was his self-portrait. And who was the influence? Pablo Picasso, with the Cubist theory. 
where what you see may not be reality, but it's reality to what you see. And the intriguing thing was the elite camoufleurs contributed into the chameleons. This was the high level, level of uh, camouflage deception folks for the French military. So the data is being collected. Understand when you see blue lines on a map, that means German trenches. Red lines meant allied trenches. In this case, prior to the Samael, you see as much information being transposed on the map where they have identified from all the various collection what exactly is at that particular location. But it all comes to this. This is the cartographical final point. This is your plan director. This is how the war was fought by the French and the Americans. For the most part, the British too, they had their firing maps, as they called it, where all the information is collected. And you see the color coding and stuff like that that tells the combatant, this is what you've got to expect. So when you do the analysis, you have to make sure that you define what those targets are. Now, here it is. Here's your stereoscope, and here's a standard overlapping coverage of a particular target set. Through the media, they ended up calling the stereoscope the deadliest weapon of the war. Because in a positional war where you didn't have much maneuverability, this basically determined who was going to live and who was going to die. Because you picked out your target sets from that analysis. And then you execute the final phase. In this case, for a show as a voisin, flying and dropping bombs. Here is the legend from that plan director. Look at all the target sets you have. You have observations. You have uh, flamethrowers. You have major trench networks. You have lots of things there that were standard to the thinking of the combatant on that map legend. And then you figured out where they were. And when you had that data, you then develop a terrain relief, such as you see here where you find out exactly what was the ground, the topographical reality. And then you basically conduct analysis on how you're going to fight that battle. For the artillery, in this case, the triangle of fire section is brought in. These folks right here would get all the information from the target's areas. They would find information on the opposing enemy artillery units and then develop the targeting plan for each night for the artillery. And here was the weapon of choice. This was the most destructive weapon in the war. The machine gun had great reputation, but it was the artillery that was your piece for annihilation. And this is where folks need to understand the thinking behind all of intelligence collection in the First World War, was to make sure that every round fired destroyed the target. And note your camouflage. Aerial coverage applied also to aerial bombardment. This is from the Billy Mitchell folders. And you see a, a brightly colored folder to kind of distinguish it from the others. In this case, these are targets involving the rail and, and train stations. Your targets didn't get prioritized, in this case for munitions. What you're looking at here is very important, important, and secondary importance. And you'll see that on maps to say, OK, fine. If we're going to do a strike, let's go to the very important one for whatever reason. And then let's conduct a mission and drop some bombs. The final discussion is on the people involved behind all this. What you find is an incredible list of folks who did an, an amazing job and transforming this massive piece called intelligence into a very workable process. And someone likens what you're seeing here to the revolution that occurs, like the building of the automobile and such. Mass production of information now takes place in the Great War and allows folks to start thinking in terms of products will become generally available at a certain time and to a certain degree of detail for you to do your next step, execute. Rene Raquel was the commander of the Henri Farman 
seven escadrille. Uh, he had another job. He came back to this, the seventh escadrille and was killed in an airplane crash. The other day, I just did a Google search, get ready for this pitch, and uh, put his name in, and somebody said, check out the Missouri Columbia newspaper from August of 1917. Sure enough, poof, there it comes. They had an article devoted to Rene Raquel and his death. I'd never seen that in the New York Times or in the, any of the British papers or any of the other intel. And it was a reporter's discussion of the fact that, thanks to him, artillery adjustment took place more effectively with the French military. He was able to determine ways to communicate from the air to the artillery to allow them to respond right away. During the first Marne, he found a German unit at this particular juncture, art communicated that to the artillery. Artillery rained terror and hell on fire on that uh, particular location, wiped out that entire unit. So he understood the process. Unfortunately, he was not able to survive the war. David Henderson is the unsung hero in many ways. Uh, he is an intel guy. Now, this is my second edition of my book. Has anybody ever been put in a situation where you wrote something and you gave it to the publisher, and just as they're going to press, you find out about this sort of thing? Hey, wait a minute, can you slow up the process? No, we're off to the press. Well, in this case, this is what happened here with David Henderson. I discovered, at the, literally at the last moment of the first edition, that he was the first commander of the Royal Flying Corps. And the fascinating thing about it was he wrote the book on military intelligence for the British Army based on his years of experience working for Kitchener in Africa, in South Africa. The book became the standard for the British Army for 35 years in the 20th century. And then he decides, hey, I think I'll get into this aviation gig. It looks kind of intriguing. And because of that, because of his stature and such, he became the first flag officer for the Royal Flying Corps. Now, where I find it interesting, and this is where it hasn't really been effectively described, is the discussion of the first Marne, which I think was probably the most important battle in the 20th century. Because if things had not happened right, the Germans would have won that battle, and you would have rewritten the entire history. How they would have, we would have dealt with the Germans in the 20th century would have been a different story. Maybe we wouldn't have had World War II, no telling. But thanks to French and British aviation, they were able to acquire, through normal aerial observations, under his leadership, in this case with the British, the process by which they would find that information, get back, have it analyzed and disseminated to the decision makers. The Germans are about ready to encircle the British Army at Mons, Belgium. Thanks to the aviators, they were able to retreat south of Paris and set up and fight another day, in this case, fight the First Marne. If the Germans had been able to successfully encircle the British Army, it would have been a different story. French aviation was able to determine the fact that the British, or that the German Army was splitting, moving west as opposed, question, east as opposed to west towards Paris. They were able to get the British Army into the middle of that, and then the Battle of the Marne was fought and successfully won by the Allies. Again, key points based on critical information. The best of the intelligence people in the First World War was Lieutenant General George McDonough. His legacy is such that he understood the process. He was able to take aerial reconnaissance effectively communicate it, do the analysis. For whatever reason, he was the one who told the British general staff, you got a problem. All your German armies are moving from Russia, thanks to the end of that particular theater of war, and are coming west. Oh, by the way, we expect them to have a major offensive against us. And sure enough, on the 21st of March, you have Operation Michael, which almost wiped out the Fifth Army. They almost made it to Calais and to the sea and that would have rewritten the war. The Americans wouldn't have been unable to do much if that had happened. But McDonough had called it. So intel is only as good as the person who takes it on. We mentioned Sykes in Dick's briefing. Here's another unsung hero, but he was also, he was one of his biggest, own, his own worst problems. He's kind of like a Don Knotts on steroids. He just, <laughs> I mean, he's brilliant, and he works very well with Henderson, but he has this tendency to piss people off, and Trenchard hated his guts. 
And Trenchard's biography talks about it over and over where Sykes was this source of intrigue. Well, Sykes was doing his job. He just had this inability to really you know, play it politically with a person like Trenchard. But he helped establish the infrastructure for the Royal Flying Corps. He was the first military wing commander prior to the Great War starting. He was, um, helped develop the tank corps. He helped develop the machine gun corps. And then he became, in 1918, because Trenchard quit, Henderson had retired from the Royal Flying Corps, and Branker was doing something else, he became the first chief of staff of the Royal Air Force in 1918. But his legacy has been pushed aside. Intrigue, yes. There's discussion that maybe the Trenchard folks kind of quietly eliminated his files and left only Trenchard to tell the story. Within this French side, here's the mastermind behind how they developed the entire photographic interpretation process. He develops the photographic labs. He develops most of the cameras. He develops the process by which film is acquired and so on and so forth. Maurice Grew. He retires as a commandant major. The British had Frederick Laws. Frederick Laws was part of a team of brilliant people that came to the Royal Flying Corps before the war and helped develop the photographic process. Now, excuse me if I say something out of turn here, but you notice that Frederick was an aerial observer. It's an O with a wing. The reason why I think they changed that to an N is because they used to call those guys the flying assholes. 